If you think of the most valuable startups in history, you might think of Google and Facebook and Apple, and Nutmeg doesn't come to mind, right? Well, it should. The biggest company ever to exist relied on spice and silk, among many other products. And it's not a reason company. We actually need to go back to the 1600s. We're talking, of course, about the Dutch East India Company. In this episode of Forensics, we're gonna compress their pretty fascinating 200-year story into this video and show you how today that company still left a mark on us. The origins. So let's get one thing out of the way. The name, the United East India Company translates to ve ve I'm gonna call it the VOC. And at the end of the 1500s, spices were precious. So all routes from Europe to Asia, especially the East Indias, commanded a high price. And one nation that dominated shipping was Portugal, but the Dutch wanted into this game. The Dutch began sending ships to what we know today as Indonesia, and they started seeing huge profits. Some routes even yielded 400% returns, but the risk and the cost were too high. So the Dutch learned from the British and they created a private entity company that would fund these trips. And as a result, hundreds of investors financed multiple ships. And this way they pretty much split the risk and the profit. And thus the VOC was born, but there was a problem. Britain, Portugal brought their cargo to Europe and they started lowering those sweet margins. And before we get into that, we wanna talk a little bit about some critical aspects of this VOC. So the VOC was a private entity. It was formed in 1601 and it comprised 17 board members, but it had the support of the government of the Netherlands. And when, when I say support, the Dutch government gave them a free pass to do just about anything. So the VOC could hire and fire at will. They could define their own wages. The Dutch government gave them a monopoly pretty much on trading routes to the East India for the next 21 years. Oh, and by the way, they could also wage war if they wanted to. So historians like Stephen Brown have compared the VOC to a state within a state. And that's how powerful they were. And the benefits don't end there. The incredible wealth that fueled the VOC. So did you know that the VOC is one of the first companies in history to issue stock to finance its operation. So they sold bonds to investors so they could finance their travels and they would pay them back with the profits from the returning ships, of course. They created the basis for our future, actually our current market. But the VOC was also pretty visionary. They didn't ask for funding for one trip. Instead, the funds would fuel many operations in the future. It's estimated that they raised about $110 million of today's money which would probably make them a unicorn. So the Dutch economy also helped them. Interest rates were pretty low. From 1602 to 1696, dividends were between 12 and 63%, while loan interest rates were 4%. So people borrowed from banks to invest in the VOC. Borrowing and banks and interest rates existed in this time, apparently. And with such financial prowess, it didn't take long for the VOC to control all these shipping routes. The path to world domination. So the East India Company acted fast. It forged alliances with Middle Eastern and Asian countries to oust the Portuguese. And in no time, it monopolized essential products like mace, nutmeg, and cloves. The VOC sold products at 15 times the price, reaping, of course, huge profits, but it also left a path of economic and social destruction, and much of it thanks to this guy, Jan Peterson Kuhn please excuse my pronunciation. So this guy was relentless. He built many forts and settlements and took over other trading posts. In 1619, the company attacked the Portuguese trading post in Jakarta. And after securing it, it had a grasp on a vital trading road. Then the VOC sought to dominate modern day Indonesia. And under Peterson's leadership, the VOC ravaged local economies and populations. One such case is the Banda Massacre, but most remember him for creating an inter-Asia trading system. So the VOC didn't deal mainly in Europe. In fact, only the best products with the highest markups reached Europe. Instead, the East India Company profited from trading inside Asia. So their primary trading post was Bengal. And there were more powerful economies trading silver, copper, silk, cotton, spices. But this wasn't some diplomatic paradise. So by 1640, the VOC had battled Vietnamese lords and Cambodians. And then it tried to use military force in China. And of course, they got their asses handed to them. But that didn't stop them at all. The VOC wanted to dominate the world. And to a degree, they achieved it. The sheer absurdity of the East India Company proportions. So the VOC had colonies 
settlements or trading hubs in modern Malaysia, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Persia, Taiwan, and South Africa, just naming a few. And he was even in Japan, and this was for 200 years the only place where Europeans could trade with Japan. Wherever the VOC was, it was ruthless. In South Africa, for example, they colonized the Cape of Good Hope, which is of course an important resting place on the way to Asia. And the VOC would let you rest there, but of course, at an exorbitant cost. So these guys, had expanded to absurd levels by 1669. They had over 150 merchant ships, 40 warships, 70,000 employees at its largest, and that does not count slaves, and a primary army of 10,000 soldiers, plus dividends paid 40% on the original investment. So no wonder that the East India Company became the largest company in the world and in history. And let's talk about that for a moment. The biggest company in the world Here's where we need to be careful. Yes, historically, there's evidence to say that it is the richest company the world has ever seen. But how rich is controversial? The usual valuation was around $7.9 trillion when the East India Company was worth 78 million Dutch guilders. Other sources place the value in the range of seven to eight trillion, but some historians have valued it at around $2 trillion. So let's take that popular 7.9 trillion valuation. That would mean that this company is roughly two Germany's, twice Germany's GDP at the time we shot this video, which is any way you slice it, just a shit ton of money. So the East India Company grew at a pace unseen before or after. From 1603 to 1670, they dominated the world, but then they didn't. So what happened? This is company forensics after all. So how they crashed, how the VOC slowed down. There are a lot of reasons for the decay of the East India Company. First of all, trade with some Asian countries like Japan began to slow down. Japan tightened the conditions for business. And then the VOC lost a lot of the silk trade with China due to internal political chaos. And then the constant conflict between the Dutch and the British damaged the East India Company's fleet. This hampered its ability to trade with Europe. After losing some of its naval power, the VOC proved to be vulnerable. Countries like Britain, France, Denmark used their trading companies and challenged the East India Company's monopoly. So to protect its supplies, they created forts and they created trading hubs in other locations. And it desperately tried to maintain this monopoly on trade, but at a huge cost. And you want to add to this that the VOC was desperate to have control over commodities that were losing importance. By 1690, the company was investing heavily in a market that was already losing ground. So they lost power and the Dutch nation did as well. Moreover, critical military losses weakened its grip on Asia. So the VOC made an aggressive effort to amplify its operations and entered into this expansion age. But the numbers weren't kind to them. Losing the numbers game. So the East India Company was really expensive to maintain from the start. You had forts, you had employees, ships, supplies, and most of that was a fixed cost. And while this recipe worked great at the beginning, times were changing. So let's look at some of these numbers. From 1630 to 1670, known as the Golden Age, annual profit was on average 2.1 million guilders. And about 50% of that was dividends. So the rest, the VOC reinvested in its massive operations. And as a result, profits were about 18% of the total revenue, which is still pretty good. So in the expansion age from 1680 to 1630, the annual profits was around 2 million guilders. Huge part of that went out to dividends, about 25% got reinvested, but profits were about 10%. And the same happened with the ROI, which went from 6% on the golden age to 3.4% in the expansion age. The problem was that from a distance, the numbers still seemed good. So the leadership and the investors weren't at all concerned. And if you've seen this show, that's usually not a good sign. The decline. One of the main reasons for the downfall was the deterioration of trade with Asia. The ever-changing continent was going through internal battles, political tension, and this forced the East India Company to ditch some trading routes and some settlements. It lost even more of that power in Asia. And meanwhile, the British, for example, made their trading routes more efficient. As a result, they dominated the import of tea from China to Europe. Company culture, if you could call it that, also suffered. Historians say that the VOC conditions were also very harsh and the pay was so low that employees avoided working altogether. But there wasn't much of a problem with that because there was little control over them. Then the stockholders were also to blame. After 1730, when numbers began to drop, they only 
decreased dividends slightly. From 1730 to 1780, the East India Company regularly paid more dividends than earnings. And to finance itself, the VOC took out loans on expected revenues, but these were higher in interest rate and sometimes didn't perform as well. Another huge blow came from the British. The Fourth Anglo-Dutch War again ravaged the VOC fleet, taking around half of its ships. Plus, rapid British expansion took over valuable routes and markets. Historians believe that at the time, the East India Company had around 62 million guilders of total capital. And thus, the losses during the war amounted to about 48 million guilders. Meanwhile, the world was expanding. As a result, Asian sugar was no longer coveted, as Brazilian sugar was now cheaper. And that wasn't the only affordable product coming from the Americas. Tension in Asia was high. The VOC didn't help its own case with China when it pillaged houses and killed Chinese citizens in a revolt. Now the East India Company was really on hot waters. First, it fell under investigation for the first time in its history, with many questioning its practices. And then, with the new Batavian Republic, came the nationalization of the East India Company in 1796. With the nationalization, the company effectively ceased to exist as a private entity, but still the government made several attempts to revive the East India Company in the next three years. But there was no use for that. After many failed attempts, in December 31st, 1799, the rights to the VOC expired. Most of the possessions fell to the British. They returned the scraps to the Kingdom of the Netherlands a few years later, but these were only chewed bones. Instead, these rotten fragments reminded the Dutch that they once had the greatest company on earth and that it ate itself to oblivion. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. Uh, this was a very different story from what we usually cover on tech, but let us know if you'd like us to keep making videos like this. Don't forget to subscribe. Please hit that bell button. YouTube helps us uh, get our videos to you with that. And we'll see you next week.